Um, of course, uh, he has initially started with uh, the BSc and PhD in electrical engineering coming from Imperial College, uh, London, UK. And uh, he has uh, ex um, work experience or the, con the contributions to the Sun Microsystems in USA and Philips uh, Electron in Europe. Of course, his forte um, subsequently um, worked in standards, uh, worked with uh, ISO, ITU, and ITF in, um, in this media compression space, and um, a strength that he is uh, using to transfer knowledge today to us, our research students, is in the intellectual property domain. So, uh, and his experiences basically from artificial intelligence, machine learning, and uh, data security, and uh, media compression, the three broad areas, he can, uh, his expertise is on, but uh, he has a wide experience in not in uh, research and entrepreneurship um, and so on. As I said again, he uh, he said he's very happy to uh, support and uh, uh, give this um, transfer of knowledge to our research student community. And that's what he's uh, doing um, today and uh, joining early from California, uh, losing some, some sleep time. Uh, I think it's we at maybe five thirty or five, maybe I, um, yeah. maybe in uh, in California right now. So, uh, Dr. Gerard, we are just starting this what we call as a lighthouse talks. Uh, this is mm. a guest guest talk series. FTS is having. We are continuing with that. The idea being to strengthen and empower research students to understand this going out of their the very narrow specialization that they be doing the research, but they need to know more and when we translate research, how to write uh, and how to secure IP and visit the theme of this uh, presentation, secure IP as well as write research papers. And that's uh, Enigma maybe uh, you will throw light on today. Over to you, uh, Dr. Gerard, and a warm welcome. Okay. okay, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Professor Ajit. Um, I would like to do this. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to introduce, uh, I also asked one of my colleagues called Jehan Pereira to join this call because he's been, uh, he works with me very closely in the field. I mean, he may not say anything, but I thought it would be nice for him, have to ha him, have him also on the call because as we go along, I'll explain uh, how I coordinate with the people at Zone on particular IP issues. So, so that's that's Jehan. Now, let me now try to share the screen here. Uh, window, hold on. Oh, got it. Got it. I think you have this now. It says patent and publish. I hope you have this slide. Is is this the correct size? Is there anything that you want me to zoom up or anything like that? Otherwise, I can leave it here, and we can continue. Right now you got this. Okay, so uh, so what I as as you said correctly, Professor Ajit, what I want to talk today is about patents and publishing. How to publish uh, your research while securing the intellectual property rights? Because you want to make sure that I know you are in an academic environment. The principle of an academic environment is free flow of knowledge. We understand that, but then what we want to do is to give some ideas if you don't mind hold on um, give some ideas on how to um, continue your research continue in the academic environment and still be able to secure your intellectual property rights where it is appropriate okay so what so first of all i'll tr try to set the sp set the um, agenda by saying there are different types of ip intellectual property okay uh, there are patents the most obvious there are also trademarks and service marks i hope you can see this slide number two please let me know if it's okay right slide number two um, Fine. okay good right then there is copyright and there are trade secrets i think tr trade i will go through the the last three just very quickly <laughs> okay trademarks is quite obvious these are the trademarks. There's a there's a mechanism on trademarking which I did not talk about. If necessary, it's a pretty simple thing. I can actually send some pointers to that. Okay, and uh, now there's copyright. This is quite important. I just want to write uh, two two sentences literally on it. That's all. Two or three sentences. There is an 
usually in copyright law, there's something called an implicit assumption of copyright ownership to the owner, author. That's why you see quite often in documents or even in programming code, you see something saying uh, the, the year of at which it was pr uh, provided in a licensed manner or whatever. You see that quite often in code. So that's what it is. But it is also possible to register a work. A work is a work of art, work of some work of an author, so that it can be registered. In the United States, there's explicitly something called the Copyright Office, which can do that. And the cost is relatively small. We are talking about of the order of less than $100 to, to perform a copyright like this. It could be on code, it could be on a piece of art, any of this, okay? Now, so that's all that is. Now, trade secrets, I just want to mention it, but this may not be relevant in, for, the, for your audience, for the, for the academic audience, but trade secrets are another form of intellectual property, okay? So for the remainder of the presentation, I'm going to be focusing on the patterns, okay? So why protect IP, which includes patents? First, it provides a financial incentive for both the academic institution as well as for the researchers. And uh, there's also the additional value for inventors of a given patent for the resume or the curriculum vitae, CV. It's, it, in certain audiences, it has a similar value to an academic publication. I mean, that's, I know this is arguable, but this could be an interesting uh, opportunity for an individual to improve their resume or the CV in this manner, okay? In an industrial setting, there are other values in patterns. I mean, it's, it's jokingly said that the purpose of a patent is to ensure that I can conduct my business and to prevent the competitors from conducting their business. I put it nicely here. I think that is a that is the fundamental value that it provides to companies that it can you know it allows me to conduct my business that is to conduct it without the risk of lawsuits from competitors and also to if 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 it's up to me that I could judge whether to allow a competitor or to prevent a competitor from conducting business uh, for a given product range for a solution the the so that those are the main purposes of patents i see okay now going to some uh, some i'm just providing some useful preliminary information here by the way at various points when there are um, by the way i will distribute this slide presentation immediately after this um uh, professor ajit i may distribute it to you so you can redistribute i presume to uh, to the audience um right. but uh, so it, it, it's got all the pointers of interest value here, references and pointers. I just made sure it's there, okay? Now, so in terms of the types of patterns, there are three types called the utility pattern, the commonest form. Then there are the design patterns and there are plant pattern. Plant means literally plants, plants, you know, organic plant, really. It's nothing more than that. So the utility patterns are the most commonest, where you have this extensive writing, which describes the, the body of text, describing what you're trying to pattern, uh, the invention. Then there are what are called claims, okay? Claims are written in a very legalistic manner. Usually it is just like in a legal document, you write it in a single sentence with a carefully separated uh, commas and semicolons and colons so that it's, it stands as a, a formal document. It's like an algorithmic form written in that manner, okay? So those are utility patterns. There are design patterns. These mostly consist of pictures and diagrams. For example, there's a well-known lawsuit that was conducted that I followed quite closely. This is between Apple and Samsung, I think, where they literally took the shape of the mobile phone surface, whether it is curved a bit, not curved, etc. And it was a long drawn out patent uh, litigation between Apple and uh, Samsung on the some design patent relating to the, the, the work that was done 
uh, by uh, Samsung in developing their uh, mobile phones. So that went on and it's a, it, it ended up in an enormous loss settlement, etc. Now, plant pattern, as I said, it is specifically for the type of limited set of plant, as I described, inventing or discovering and asexually reproducing a distinct and new variety of plants. And this cannot be used in naturally occurring plants, naturally reproducing plants. You can imagine what happens. When it comes to that matter, there are other issues. You know, you probably heard about some uh, medicine, um, you know, naturally occur occurring plants being used in medicine, how certain companies go around the world and try to pattern, uh, try to protect them. What they do normally is they take this stuff and they re they generate some med what is, medicines out of them, and the act of producing the medicine they are tried they patent it as a utility patent. So that's what they do. Now, the the next point I want to deal with are that there are three types of entities or organizations which can file patents. I th I thought I should bring this up, although there's a question mark at the end. Now, they're called the regular size companies or organizations. This could be anything from, I believe it starts from a few million of dollar turnover per year up to in infinite amount of money. And there are the what's called a small and micro. You can imagine they're the tinier ones. Micro was set up recently to encourage individuals who are on low, you know, low income people, even for them to file patents and the price essentially becomes, let's say, 100% for regular, small would be like 60% or so, micro would be even smaller amount of money for the various fee schedule, the filing charges. Okay, now, um, the, in the United, this kind of range of different pricing or cost is applicable both in the United States Patent and Trademark Office, PTO, and the European Patent Office. I must say, I have not actually found anything. Maybe it's my, I cannot actually navigate through it well enough in the, in the Chinese patent uh, process. Okay. Another important point to bring up here is that in the United States, the higher education in, in institutions qualify as small entities. And I even provided a particular reference in this thing called the MPEP, Manual of Patent Examining Procedures. <laughs> I literally provided this as a legal a clause in there. One thing I did not find is whether foreign education institutions qualify for the same privileges as U US institutions. I think this I can find out, but I did not in the time I had to prepare this presentation, I could find that information because that could be relevant to you. Ex excess, really important, I would say. So I want to give this example because I thought this is an interesting one about the value of patterns coming from the academia. Okay. So there's one of the most celebrated cases of patterns benefiting universities is the one that was done by um, Princeton University, I did mention, uh, yeah, yeah, Princeton University, which uh, developed this uh, and the, the principle of the anti cancer drug. Okay, this drug is used for the treatment of malignant plural mesothelioma. Thiloma, mesothelioma. Okay, this is a lung, uh, this is a lung cancer associated with the exposure to asbestos. And this was done by based on the work from this person who had recently passed passed away, Professor Edward C. Taylor. I I believe he started his PhD work in the 19 early 50s or so, and he was he was a professor. And subsequently, during his time tenure as professor, his team developed this work, and this drug alone had a sales of um, something like 1.7. You know, U.S. dollars, billion, billion U.S. dollars in 2009. Given that a patent usually has a lifetime of 20 years, effectively 15 years, 17, 15 years after the patent filing process, um, this is quite an quite a valuable patent. This turned out to be quite a valuable patent for Princeton University. Um, 
the the actual amount that is being that princeton university got out of this patent is unknown because it's all under non disclosure agreement and the company that actually marketed this product this drug was called eli lilly okay um however it is speculated that they got something of the order of 1% okay that tells you something also about the the unequal status of between companies and universities but still 1% out of 1.7 billion is is quite something okay so what are the benefits in patenting and where to patent this is more about the jurisdictions i really want to cover that here this is the basic principle that people follow so a patent on an invention grants exclusive rights to a product or a process so th the whole point of the exercise is this product or process cannot be commercially made used distributed imported or sold by anybody else without the pers permission of the patent owner it's not only being made but all the way to the point of being sold so you can see why i brought this up why china and the us okay for example um, if a product is made in china and imported sold into the united states the choice is whether to patent it in both china and usa or only in the usa because pat the uh, the patenting process if you include it with lawyers could be anything between in the united states could be $4000 to $10000 depending on the type of lawyer complexity of the patent etc the whole lifetime of it but uh, if you want to now target many countries you really have to be careful because it could it's a some amount of money goes into this okay um so uh, so, so that is why i will now go into the whole issue about where you patent and when you patent the process patent it because it's a it's a it, there's cost involved okay so now what path to take to ip in ip protection so first there's a very interesting pretty simple process called the provisional patent process the united states patent office has in, has got which makes it easy to quickly uh, file a patent invention invention for in between $75 and $300 usd that range depends on the size of this entity remember i said regular size small size micro it's 300 for regular 150 dollar for you um uh, small and micro 75 dollars even that small so it's a pretty small amount uh, money it gives you a one year grace period to continue to the next stage this could be either a pct call a patent uh, some a filing process based on the patent cooperation treaty or a non provisional i'll explain this to you now now the pct is a process that was introduced by the world intellectual property organization that is based in geneva and they have a process which is similar to provisional patent but slightly more expensive and um, um, it's something around 750 dollars starting point i believe okay and what the pct gives you is an 18 month grace period then there's of course the next step could be a directly a non provisional patent filing now i try to put it in the form of a, a table like this so when you have an invention you can the best path i suggest i mean most people follow we have followed is to first do this provisional filing in a, which gives you a one year grace period to decide the next step at this point you may have struck a deal with a company and who's now willing to fork out the money for each of the countries of interest for a non provisional filing or you could still get an 18 month further extension grace period by taking the pct path the patent cooperation treaty filing process and then decide to do the non provisional filing and i would say 
um, you know, you can see the value of it. You can get immediately a 30 month grace period in order to before you decide what to do. Maybe you are, you know, actively looking for funding, looking for cooperation with some companies or develop or generating the whatever it is justification to pay for this. OK, and I must say this um, when we do this, my personal experiences, whether it is done with another company, in our case, Zone does it ourselves. Um, we look at every at every step. We see what is the business value to this. Is it worthwhile going to the next step? The eventual step is a non-provisional filing, which can take up to, as I said, starting at $4,000. And I'll spend a bit of time explaining why the, the, the difference in pricing, the, the cost. OK, so that's a process. And as to which country to file in, I mentioned in a previous slide, uh, it depends on what your business interest is, what you are trying to do. For example, if you are trying to now, um, as I said, let's say the China and the US case, it may be simple to file it in the US. You don't have the you know, translation fees and everything else that you have to pay for if it's in a country where the, the language of filing is not English. Okay. So, so it's like that. Uh, so in the US, it's well known, the whole process. So what do you do next? So that's why I said that the, the path of 30, 30 month grace period being obtained through the provisional patent in the US and the PCT filing through WIPO gives you that nice grace period to start this off. And the, the, the advantage of the, the PCT process is that the, the patent quality, I believe something like most of the countries in the world, most of the entities other than Western Sahara, you can see, and South Sudan are signatories to the, the to this, uh, the, the WIPO. That means filing in, uh, for those 18 months, in addition to the first 10, uh, 12 months, uh, you have a, you, you are so effectively protected. You're given a priority date in all of these countries. So which gives you a very good margin to think about what the next step should be. So, uh, so I won't also spend a bit of time. There's a lot of conjecture argument about which dates are important. Okay. And I did this because it's a very hot topic in the United States amongst the, uh, the intellectual property legal community. Um, there's a concept of the date of what they call the date of conception. That is when you thought of the idea. It, it may not be when you actually detail provided all the, you know, detail analysis, detailed design or anything like that. Basic concept. Second one, date of actual reduction to practice. When the inventors fully formulated the idea, and I think that is when you put it all on paper, carefully document it, carefully go through the analysis, may even do some experimenting to say, this is now an invention. Fully, you are confident of the invention. Then the date of filing patent. This is called the date of constructive reduction to practice. It's also called that in this case. Now, um, then, that's another two points I want to bring up. Most countries follow the principle of first to file FTF. I think that's, a, that's what most countries are. United States and I believe it was Canada and Philippines. Canada now dropped the FTF, uh, first to invent. That's an important principle. And only US and Philippines are left. And even the US, there's a bit ma major debate going on. They were the only two countries. They are the only two countries, or were a few years ago, who were adhering to the first to in invent principle. If you look at it, the first to invent sounds fair, fairer than the FTF first to file. It's because it essentially, in principle, rewards the first inventor not to win the race to the patent office. Um, um, I don't know whether you are aware of it. There's a nice, uh, it's a myth in this community is that even these two guys, there were these two people, what is it, Bell, Graham Bell 
and uh, somebody else. It seems one of these guys had an had a connect contact in the patent office. So when his, when his competitor was filing a patent, he would get the information and he would file it ahead of pretend to be ahead of the other guy. So he would be able to get the patent first. This was a very common practice of you know corruption, you could say. Okay, um, but the problem with the FTI first to invent is that it becomes a content contentious matter leading to legal proceedings and it can be for a small entity it can be a, a very prohibitive with a small legal budget and um, i remember when i was working at philips sometimes when there was a, some lawsuits would come up and they would uh, want to go through all my logbooks in those days in the 80s there people used to keep real logbooks paper logbooks because i was in the research labs and they would ask me to provide all the logbooks to to show because it's dated. You know, we are supposed to date the 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 when when we had any discussions, thoughts, or anything to do with any of the topics I was working on. And they would want to they they would produce those as evidence in a court of law in the United States to show that somebody working at Philips Research Labs had thought of this idea on such a date. So that's why logbooks became very important at, in the were important in those days, and even today, actually, in certain law case suits, that the the date of conception becomes an important matter in these cases. Okay, so uh, so that's FTI, but the FTF first to file is very clear cut. Somebody who gets the patent. The filing, the record in the office, particular filing or uh, patent office, gets there first. Essentially, wins the race. In the United States, they have moved theoretically from into the first to file principle with this with the act that they had passed in 2011. But there's still much debate in the United States as to whether it is valid for a law for an act to. Over, over, overwrite essentially what they are saying is that it is they have interpreted you know certain lawyers that the that in even in the constitution there is a clause or whatever which claims that it favors first to invent i mean it's a matter of how it is written and how it's interpreted so they there's a claim there's a uh, one school of thought there even has to be a constitutional amendment in the united states to, in order to be able to move to first to file. And uh, just an aside, constitutional amendments in the United States are very long drawn out affairs. It has to be passed in something like two thirds of the local states, and it becomes a near impossible thing to do. Yeah, uh, uh, by the way, I should have also said, um, I will have time at the end, I hope, to ask any questions, but please send questions as, as Professor Ajit said. And I'll be able to answer them as we go along. Okay. Okay. So, in fact, I'm coming to the point where. Uh, so, I want to say how to avoid certain common mistakes. So, there are three points: record your invention, limit discussion with the outside, and I'll come to each of these, and give explicit notice if you cannot help discussing it with the outside. I'll dis describe what each means. Recording your invention. I think it's very simple. The provisional filing or a PCT filing is a pretty simple process. Um, it, um, I'm giving from experience. Jehan, he works with me. He's very good at turning this out in a, something like a week. Okay, we do it ourselves. We don't go to a lawyer because you know it, in the United States, even doing a provisional filing can cost about uh, the filing itself is pretty trivial, 150 or 300 dollars. But the uh, the the cost is involved in the legal fees, and that can be anything up to two thousand dollars. Even if if we were to ask a lawyer to file it, so we do it. Jehan does the whole thing, knows the whole language, uh, how to file it, everything. We do it. So so that's a pretty straightforward thing. If you were to do it yourself, okay. Um, so, uh, so that's the the recording the invention. Now, limiting discussion with the outside world, which means anybody outside your organization. I mean, that's a very fuzzy term outside your organization. 
Now, um, this is in an academic environment, it may be difficult. Maybe you want to have discussions with your collaborators from another in academic institution, either locally or abroad. OK, and uh, so that's one example. The other case that you probably need to consider is also what happens um, when you are collaborating with a company. So in that case, do you consider the company to be inside or outside? Because a comp that you let's say you have come to some agreement with a company and you even already have worked out the. Let's say the 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 revenue sharing from any work that you do, revenue sharing agreement with, with a company, then uh, that company would be part of the inside because you have already come up with a non-disclosure agreement that comes to the third point also with that company as to what, the, what is covered in this agreement and all the precise details of that, then you would consider that to be an insider, inside company. Now, um, academic, uh, let's say publications that you make obviously that's outside i call that outside i don't know whether you get involved in it i get quite often involved in standards or setting work and just before a standard if we have a some technical contribution to a standard you see that um, not only us everybody who participates in the standards body you know that they will be busily filing their provisional filing before they attend the meeting so the funny thing is, usually within an area like video compression, we know the dates when the, pro the priority date is. Essentially, it's a day before the meeting started. There are, let's say, in MPEG video compression, H.264, there are four meetings a year. We know virtually all the patterns in the area of video compression have a date, which is one of those four dates in the year. It has been going on for the last 30 years because everybody who said actively involved in the standards body, they first file the patent before they discuss it outside in a larger community. OK, so now about the giving the explicit notice, I want to talk about that a bit. Uh, this is um, the best form of uh, is to uh, first have a non-disclosure agreement Non-disclosure agreement ex effectively explicitly calls out the notice about intellectual property patent ownership by your organization and the other party. OK, and if a non-disclosure agreement is not possible to minimize the information provided to the third party. And even if that's not possible during the pre presentation, give verbal or written notice of IP ownership by your organization. This could be, for example, saying, by the way, that's how I usually say, by the way, please note what we are discussing this now has some intellectual property that we own. I would literally say that very formally. And somebody would take notes of that, note of that or record it. And that is considered valid in this in this case of providing explicit notice. OK, um, I would say at this point, I have uh, essentially covered most of the major topics. There are other areas that I wanted to cover, but I thought it will be another you know, lengthy presentation. It's about the areas about um, uh, open source projects and how do you participate in open source projects on one side and what happens when you you'd use some code and some information from an open source project in your work that that is commonly to do with uh, computer computing and related electrical engineering type of work. So it may not be applicable to all your uh, research interest, your the audience research interest, because there are a lot of it's a minefield. I'll call it minefield as we call it because. Quite often, when an open source project is available, your pro some of you may be familiar with uh, the, G the, the GNU public GPL uh, public license, GNU public license. It's a, it's a, it looks good from an academic point of view because you can get a lot of information from a, another party who have also already done the work, benefit from it, but it actually can cause major headaches 
in terms of because essentially by using that code you're implicitly giving up some of your intellectual property rights and i don't know whether some of you have actually attended this i heard that a few years ago even the guy the main mr gpl stallman he had visited sri lanka maybe about five or six years ago somebody told me sankalpa told me actually uh, that and uh, so he is the guy who has been pu pushing the gpl thing ex extensively is great for the academic academic purposes but not for commercialization the other area that I, it's another very lengthy area that i wanted to cover no i did not get a chance to put it together is this it's about what happens when you participate in a consortium or a standard setting body because what happens then is part of the agreement of the consortium or the standard setting body is where you give up some of you know you say that you adhere to the li licensing policies of that entity the commercial the consortium or the standard setting body and by doing that you are essentially limiting yourself the freedom to maneuver for example the iso international standards organization and iec the international electrotechnical committee um, and itu they have very very rigid intellectual property right uh, policies and if you are to participate in it you need to therefore understand what are you how you benefit a lot of course from being in a standard setting body if your technology invention gets into a patent into a into a into a standard it can be big pretty impressive worth a lot there are some examples actually i've been involved in doing some work for some relating to some lawsuits and uh, where a patent could be worth of the order of in the lifetime of the patent in those cases specific ones i was involved in evaluating um, on behalf of some law firm is has been approximately of the order of 200 million dollars so it could be worth quite a lot, but you give up certain uh, rights in the act of participating in the consortium. So, uh, so those are details. I didn't want to go into too much because I thought it's you know, getting very confusing. We can cover that separately if necessary, or I, I can provide direct advice to any of you on that matter because I've been quite involved in it from every side. Okay, but I th I think this is the end of my talk now. Okay, so there's ample time to ask if there are any questions and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jarad. Uh, right, I think we can take up questions and um, you can ask some. Uh, okay, we have the first question on the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm opening up the chat. Let me see how to read it please hold on i'm sorry i didn't pay attention to the if I put in, not in US, who did possible someone else to produce in china then important no this is the point you see i've been quite involved in this in this specifically that's why i'm very familiar with the china situation apply for innovation okay i'll go with the first one from uh, sechem sorry Okay, so the point is that's why I brought up the countries of interest. Remember, in my in my presentation, I said, you know, in that table, in that in that flow flow diagram, I said that at some point you had to decide where to focus your interest. You could do it in in this particular case, both in China because that's where most things are made, and let's say United States imports it. Now, um, in the United States, there are there are certain bodies like the F Federal Trade Commission, and people can actually petition those entities to say that a product is brought into. The, let's say in this case, I have a patent in the United States on a particular solution product which I claim to be important. Okay, this in mind. Then there's a, this company from China who produces it without getting my license, pay me anything and they try to bring it into the United States. So there is a certain federal, uh, I forgot, it's a three-letter US government agency. I've been quite involved in FTC, I think. And uh, so what they do is that you can petition those guys through go through an arbitration process, and they will then decide whether to even stop the imports into the United States. And it happens very often very often that so this i think i hope it answers the question so if they can produce it but they cannot sell it 
when they import it into the United States, you can effectively call it contraband goods to that extent. Okay, I don't. I believe the same thing. Of, United States is rather draconian or rather rigid about this process. I believe in the in the European Union. I don't think there is such an entity like that particular government agency because U.S. is no European Union is twenty seven countries. They're all distributed. You have to go for each country independently. That's a problem. But U.S. is very clear. It's happened so often, and providing what do you call it? Uh, written justifications. I've been so involved in this. So to this is essentially to prevent a company from I know uh, one particular company <laughs> I don't have to give names which was producing certain electronic equipment which was sent to the United States they they thought they could sell it but because I mean you probably know that you can buy some some item through Amazon or Alibaba or whatever and you can get it brought into the United States uh, it'll be just shipped in. On a one-off basis, usually that is not something one goes after. You go after, you go after when there's a large marketing operation, large distribution operation. Okay, so you know when there's a large distribution operator operation, then you can go after. It's worth going after that company from China and preventing them from importing the product and certainly in selling the product in the United States. So that's the first question. I hope I answered that. In, in, uh, innovations as well as innovation. I'm looking at the second question. Please hold on. Something more than just an invention. Oh, can you, uh, is it Mahesh? Do you want to elaborate on that? Your, your question, the second question? Uh, you know, your question here, I'm sorry. Or do you want to write up? It's up to you. Because I don't get the process apply for innovations as well as innovation. Is something more than just an invention? Hello, good evening, sir. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Please explain a bit more. You put dot dots, which yeah. means you have to explain a bit more. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so when it comes to uh, innovation, like something more than an in invention, the commercial aspects are also there. Yeah, that's right. So I, I want to know is there any special uh, process to be followed when it comes to innovations? No, it, this is why I put it only guidelines. Usually, the invention is purely on the on the the process patent or method of developing the solution okay and in developing the product i must say there's much more than the initial idea usually the school the rule of thumb we follow as you can see even from the eli lilly patent did you see that uh, princeton is getting out of the order of one percent I'm not trying to minimize the importance of the invention, but there's a lot more involved in it. And some of it you could even say is uh, bogus, spurious. You know what I mean by that? The company would like to show when, if you have a clever idea, you go to a certain company. I have been on both sides, by the way, so I know how it is. Then the negotiation begins. Then they'll say, ah, your invention is only worth 1%. Most of the, most of the sweat, blood, sweat and tears in developing the product solution is in the whole everything marketing they'll add all those things to show that there's more to it so i cannot say that there's a certain process to follow but depending on who you talk to they'll say 99 percent of of the effort goes into not the invention in how to bring it to market okay so if there's no clear written way of doing it I can only give examples from my experience and the general guidelines. That's what I was trying to do. Okay. I hope that answered your question. Or yes, is so it, there's you. anything for okay? Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, actually, actually, I want to now come to this point about, again, I'm not sure if I may just elaborate a bit on this because my colleague Jehan is on the call. He, him and we have other people also who have been brought up to the level where they understand the legal speak of, let's say, the US Patent Office exceedingly well. Jehan does. He can turn this out really impressively. So this is something 
because as i said the us law rate corporate rates you know legal corporate rates are pretty high as you probably can understand i mean when we get a consult a lawyer we can never be less than 400 dollars an hour okay <laughs> so it's a pretty high rates even for a simple consultation when a patent is written you may write it in your own hand in your own way maybe you type it in and going from that point to the document which is recognizable as a patent you probably have seen it there's the abstract body of text diagrams claims to get into that point it can be anything from 4 to 10 10000 legal fees okay as i said the filing fees are around $1000 in the us patent office cost is really not that it's the legal fees of doing the writing it up so what we have developed internally at zone is the expertise which people like jehan has to know how to write the patent in the format which is recognizable and accepted by the patent office so i'm just bringing this up as a and if you were to collaborate with a company and this company may have lot of money deep pockets and they may be willing to spend $10000 on a, a patent lawyer Uh, you know a legal firm who will do the job or they may have their internal resources like jehan so i think that also i want to bring this up because um i'm not sure how jehan how you got into this whole how you began to become such an authority in the, I, i never followed this but that is an a valuable expertise to have locally if if you are going to if you want to get involved in filing patents and so on uh, expertise to have locally maybe you want to uh, i'm not sure how uh, whether there are courses one follows to get to that point um jehan do you, are you still there on the call yes jehan uh, yeah do you know how did you have to attend some courses school uh, you know uh, whatever it is how did you get to know this thing uh, no jehan actually it was uh, asank alvis who taught me everything oh yeah and i uh, i showed him yes. how, yeah okay yes. that's what it was so yeah. uh, i learned most of the things from him and uh, yeah. it was also from the uh, wipo patent drafting manual it it lists all the all the uh, essential features and uh, yeah the, part, the the sections that you have to include in a, a patent all so, right good uh, good if you don't mind this is a very valuable piece of information if you don't mind sending to me i will include yes. it in this slide deck and then distribute this because i think sure. that's really valuable because i'm not asking the researchers in this audience to become experts in patent writing like jehan has but maybe this is a valuable thing to have uh, in your organization or in a you know with any of the companies you are collaborating with at uh, from uh, from your institution very good okay okay um dr jerad may i have a question yeah. for you from behalf of students yes please go ahead um we have situations where the the organizations have their hackathons idea thons and innovation competitions so on we experienced yeah. a situation recently when a student body part student team participates in the innovation competition uh just the submission stage itself you sign off your i mean like essentially you sign off your rights they say of now course. this belongs to a uh, you the the company right yep. after the idea is support what's your idea on that i mean they may not win something and in that case um, you have handed them um, some i know ideas. i know and by the way this applies even to the i concept of a google summer of code or some business like that I right. get really annoyed by these guys. They think that they are doing a service to mankind, human and humanity. So I should humanity, but they are being devious. That's all it is, really. They are not doing something for nothing. It's as though they are doing a philanthropic exercise. I must say, okay. So unfortunately, it is very difficult to judge this because you know that is where the academic, you know, the whole idea of interaction, discussion, free flow of knowledge works really well. Obviously. okay but somebody is benefiting from it not the students uh, that's a problem really that that kind of tricky the, the that kind of uh, whatever it is the cl clauses in that participation agreement 
these it's just like what i talked about those consortia it's like a consortium and here the students are joining out of enthusiasm and as you say they don't get any even if they if they are not if they are not on the winning list they don't even benefit from it in any way possible okay so it is right. unfortunate so i would say the best thing is if they have an idea um if there's a pretty firm idea it's better to turn out a provisional filing quickly if not a provisional filing actually i would say provisional filing is the best thing to do okay provisional filing or to state i would like to see such an agreement because if if it's possible to say yes we agree to it but please note we have pre prior ip i think right. that's that's to be looked at pretty well because you don't want to deter your students from all the enthusiasm of these hackathons and whatever it is they do okay right so i think it it needs bit scrutiny if i mean i'll be happy to look at the document and look at your agreement these agreements okay because it's it's really down to that because you should be able to put a, a caveat saying yeah we are willing to participate but please note this is the pre existing ip we have in this area which means you are stating on record that right. that you can't have this we already have uh, it's it's ours by right okay so when you sign off like that the first to file will not come right because you have a prior commitment to the organization for giving your right exactly to exactly that's right that's what it comes down to okay so i think i think those kind of i call that all part of participating in a in a consortium all the trick all the traps and minefield of participating consortia is what that what you really brought up and it's a, it's a serious problem and uh, in companies we don't uh, you know people do company employees don't usually easily participate in this if they do we scrutinize that scrutinize it heavily to see that we don't fall into those traps okay thank you yeah i would say it also falls into this whole field of open source and gpl it's all part of that it's a, it's great for academic endeavor but not for purposes of uh, gaining some um, you know re revenue eventually out of this work okay yeah any more questions now more to our students uh, recently i'm not sure whether some of the students are there from electrical and electronics engineering won a world championship in the ieee signal processing competition so they oh, had right. apparently yes. uh, yeah so they had a winning algorithm uh huh yeah so they just just uh, university received the good news That's like very good. Very good. So it's, it's yeah. world champion. Well, I mean, top, the best, right? Very good. In, uh, impressive. In what area of signal processing? I'm. That's been my old area of interest. I'll call it. What area of signal processing um, was this? If you don't, I can share the notice that was sent around oh, yeah. the university. Yeah, I would like to hear about to that. Ranga. Yeah, you can speak to Ranga, and I'm pretty. I'm, oh, I'm yes. sure Ranga would be very happy to communicate with you. yeah i will yeah of course i'll talk to professor ranga right ranga rodrigo yeah, yeah. there's another question so about i just want media and uh, having a uh, communication in communication you said is it ranga yeah that is right so it's uh, communication and there's a reflective array you have to find out the configuration of the array when the channel is uh, annoying so that was the algorithm all ah, right 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 okay okay interesting okay so you have an array you try to work out from the uh, no the configuration of the array right interesting that's, that's right yeah. yes yeah 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 this this is interesting area from communication and also you probably understand um somebody i know really closely close to me he he worked on this in the area of submarine warfare you understand that you know this also applies in there arrays and uh, how uh, so i have some background in that area that's why 
Okay, interesting. Thank you. There's another question I want to just address this quickly. Country like okay, country the like Sri Lanka does not practice professional filing. So what will be the best way for us to adopt? That's what you're asking, isn't it? That's a question. Okay. So the question is, let's see how to do that. As I said, even a I wouldn't call it a handwritten, even a simple note uh, transcribing from your notebook or something, it's better than nothing in terms of doing a pro provisional filing. Okay? It's a uh, whole point is to get something on record. It does cost a bit of money. Uh, uh, we need to see, you know, the academic institutions in Sri Lanka, what are their actually. If you like, I can actually submit a, a question to the U.S. Patent Office to find out that, okay? Because about the foreign, if it's if you can be classed as a micro entity, it costs seventy five dollars to do a profi, do a provisional filing, which is I hope I mean it's not too much, okay? So the point is now how professional should the document be? We do it person in our company. Jahan knows how to do a proper detail document like a, which looks like the final version final pattern but that's great if you have the resources expertise otherwise just filing whatever you have clearly stating this is the invention this is what you're claiming even in your words would be better than nothing i just want to emphasize that point here okay so i hope that answers the question because it's, that's better than not doing it. And also timeliness matters quite often. If you have to join a consortium, join a competition, if you have some idea, turn it around overnight, literally. That's how it comes down to. Okay. Right. Um, right, Dr. Gerard, I think uh, we have an ex we had an excellent hour on the topic. Okay. Uh, um, so uh, you joined us, you joined to depart uh, some valuable uh, advice and information to our research students, and that's the objective mm. of throwing light on on these uh, these gray areas uh, that as researchers we fear, we've, uh, we have we have to uh, endure. Um, right, I must mention that this uh, we, this your presentation was recorded, and okay. uh, need your permission. To upload it in, if uh, if if you are okay, if you agree, uh, the presentation yeah. to be uploaded into the Faculty of Graduate Studies. We have a Bolgoda Plains YouTube channel. Okay, right. It yes. all goes into this information. I hope it's okay. Um, it's it's okay. I will give formal permission to do that. Of right. course. Yeah. Uh, thank and, you. Uh, thank yeah. Yeah, and also I will I will provide the slide deck with a slight modification after Jehan provides me this pointer, very valuable pointer, how to become a professional filing writer, <laughs> writer, if right, you are interested right. in becoming that. And then I will distribute this by the weekend. What's okay? the time span from that initial instructions, reading the book and becoming this professional? Uh, uh, Jehan, you can answer this question because I don't know, it all happened in the background to me. You know, that's a problem. I did not get to know how the people in Sri Lanka got be, got to be that level of experts in writing. Jehan, how long did it take you? Uh, yes, Gerard, uh, on that, uh, this was actually, uh, it, took me, it took me around uh, six months to get acquainted to the entire process. Yeah. Uh, that, that was with practice actually, because Asanka was guiding me in uh, writing patents while I was reading the docu the drafting manual as well. So yeah. uh, I think uh, I think it could be uh, around that time limit or uh, according, like for me, it took around that much, but uh, it could vary from uh, person to person. That's that's my opinion. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that's, thank uh, you. that's excellent, Jan. Um, six months plus, I mean, like two more months, let's say, no? With the, how, how, how many filings are taken for your trial period? Uh, went through that. Uh, I did around. Uh, uh, I can't uh, exactly remember the number, but uh, it was around uh, six. I see five okay. or six. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. That's good data. I mean that that's quite good for our students to understand that. Okay, you can read that book. The Viper Manual is available, and. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you just practice and then you su then you get yeah success yeah i think thank that's good you. yeah so i will uh, thank you very much jehan also for your advice and i i will include that in my slide presentation as an extra slide on how to how to write for patterns okay. okay and then then i'll modify that and distribute this by this weekend okay, okay Jared, the coming week. right. yes so okay, the, thank you so i think we come yeah. to the end of the um, the, the first uh, lighthouse talk uh, and uh, hope the students and thank you to all the researchers and the students who joined in i saw about nearly 50 uh, for, the, for this mm -hmm. uh, presentation and i must mm -hmm. thank also the uh, from faculty of graduate studies uh, the gimhani and akash uh, for taking all the initiative and the effort to um, ensure that this uh, this event becomes reality so again finally thank you dr gerard and all of you who joined okay. in and hope this okay. information benefits you to your future okay Th thank you very much thank you thank you